welcome to the March 26, 2015 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and I'm the chair of the committee and I'll begin the meeting by asking the chair, uh, the clerk to call the roll. Present. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, the first item on our agenda <coughs> is the public comment period. And uh, I have a sign-up sheet. I have one person who has signed up at this point. Um, and I would ask folks who have signed up to come to the podium. And uh, we have a three-minute timer, which I will just get started with here. And um, I just ask you to say your name and address, Cindy, for the record. And then, um, and then when you're ready, I'll start the timer. So. She first began, I didn't need glasses, and now I need glasses. Oh. <laughs> it speaks to the time. All right. Um, good evening. My name is Cindy Mahoney, and I live at 77 Emerson Way in Florence. We have three children in Northampton Public Schools, a senior and sophomore at NHS, and a second grader. I wish to start this evening by praising two teachers in Northampton schools who epitomize differentiation in their classrooms. Katie Galensky, second grade teacher at Bridge Street, brings a thoughtful approach to curriculum while introducing new math program in her classroom and helping to guide other teachers in its implementation. Jenny Padell, physics teacher at NHS, does an excellent job of making physics interesting and challenging for the range of ages, interests, and abilities in her class. Ms. Padell brings her talents outside the classroom as well as coach of NHS's ultimate team. And if we're recognizing folks who juggle the needs of many, Cara Dupree is a master at finding gym time for all the snow-covered spring sports teams. Now to the late start issue. The American Academy of Pediatrics has stated that early start times are one factor in adolescent sleep disturbance. However, it is no coincidence that this issue has gotten more coverage with the explosion of technology. The AAP also proposes powering down electronics earlier in the evening, in their words, a media curfew, and eliminating caffeinated beverages after dinner. These are no-cost strategies families can use to help everyone in the household sleep plan. Which brings me to some of the plans proposed at the last school committee meeting. The busing proposals put forth by some of the proponents of a later start see that busing is the impediment, but it's not busing, it's money. It seems disingenuous for those who live within easy walking distance to the high school to make students who ride the bus scapegoats. One proposal put forth last year had students who ride the bus continuing to arrive at school at the current time while walkers or riders could arrive later for the late start. Another proposal has bus students staying at the high school until 4 p.m. This would not allow those students to participate in after school sports which most often run from three to five, nor would it enable them to babysit for younger siblings who'd be arriving home from elementary schools before them. And as far as the three versus two bus seat discussions, most high schoolers are nearly full grown and add a backpack full of texts, a trumpet, or a lacrosse, and three to a seat seems silly, if not downright unsafe. These busing proposals do not include the extra cost of student supervision at the high school for these additional times or bus monitors for 11-year-old sixth graders riding with 18-year-old 12th graders. As parents of a second grader who will be in the district for 10 more years, we are very glad to see that the superintendent and business administrator have taken the long view in their budget projections as a way to maintain stability for Northampton schools. The Gazette has featured stories on area towns where financial constraints are forcing local districts to make difficult decisions. There are very serious concerns facing Northampton schools, and the late start issue is detracting from those. The issues of park testing, charter school funding, the cuts threatening early childhood ed are deeply troubling. The teachers, principal, and superintendent have been very thoughtful in their choice for maintaining classes and teachers at NHS over the later start time, and like many families, we appreciate your support for them. I wish to close by thanking two more heroes of Northampton schools, Ms. Dromey, guidance counselor at NHS, and elementary school nurses, Jessica LaCroix and Kathy McCarthy, all of whom hold a special place of gratitude in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Kathy was the only person signed up to speak. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment session? Okay, hearing none, we'll move into the next item on the agenda, which is <coughs> announcements. Are there any announcements from the school committee? Mr. Moore. I have, I have one. A um, hundred years ago, Bridge Street School was a brand new building, and um, they will be holding a celebration, a hundredth birthday celebration on May 29th from 3 to 5 in the afternoon, so right after school on May 29th, that's a Friday. Um, 
But the reason for making this announcement so far in advance is because they are soliciting uh, both memorabilia or stories that anybody who has associated with Bridge Street School. Um, if you have memorabilia or a story uh, to contribute to sort of the celebration, uh, you can call the front desk at Bridge Street School, 587-1460, and um, they will accept your uh, entry. Thank you. Excellent. Any other announcements from members of the school committee? Okay, hearing none, we'll now move uh, to the uh, first item on the agenda, and this is a vote, and this is a um, contract <coughs> regarding a HVAC project related to the JFK Middle School pool. And I believe um, I can ask uh, Ms. Walzik to explain that for you. Yeah. The uh, Central Services Department has gone through designer selection and chosen the engineer to do the design of the capital project to replace the HVAC or Dectron unit up on the roof of the pool. Something I guess that's been a long time coming here. And in order to get this project on t a timeline to do the work this summer, they would like to get the contract signed now rather than waiting until the next school committee meeting so we can get a jump start of a couple of weeks. So the request tonight is to ask the school committee to authorize the superintendent to sign that contract. Make a motion to ask the superintendent to sign the contract for the JFK Pool HVAC project. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there any questions? I would urge you to sign it before this project gets any more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to get it done and it keeps getting more and more expensive. I simply make the, the uh, you know, just, just uh, as, as a member of the uh, Capital Improvements Committee, this is one that's uh, been on, uh, on our radar for uh, work to be done at JFK for quite a long time. And uh, although it's part of our JFK Middle School, you also know that it's a great community resource and so it's a project that, um, as uh, our bis business administrator said, it's one that we want to get started and get on the way as soon as possible. So, All those in favor of uh, approving the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is adopted. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, item is we return to our ongoing discussion of the proposed FY 2016 Budget, and I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna. If we could just take a minute to um, set up the overhead. Okay. I have answers to questions that were asked during the public comment or public view of the document. Okay. So we will take a quick two-minute recess so that we can get the uh, tech stuff set up, and we'll reconvene in two minutes. Thank you very much, and I'd also like to thank all of you who took the time to review the proposed budget and sent in comments. Uh, we received a number of comments via email and via our new NPS Let's Talk app, um, so I was very happy, um, very happy to get that feedback from the public. Also, um, I'm battling a little bit of a cold, so if you have trouble hearing me, it's not picking up, please let me know. So I'd like to start just by reviewing the most frequently asked questions and answers because my presumption is that if some people cared enough to write in and ask what this means, there are probably others who are wondering. So the first question, um, and this is very apropos to what the um, speaker said tonight during public comment time. Is there a plan to address the potential elimination of state aid for kindergarten? Um, as we've discussed in prior meetings, Northampton and all districts across the Commonwealth are facing an elimination of the expanded kindergarten grant. Um, for Northampton, it's an amount of about $91,000, um, which was eliminated from the governor's budget. Uh, much like the rest of the proposals we've discussed at every point in the budget process taking the long view we've had sort of taken the stance that in order to fix the problem we have to find the funding within the existing budget so um, we have a, a proposal which I put out there but I'd like to um, just sort of make it a potential uh, proposal because I'm still hopeful that the House or the Senate may restore the funds 
But in the event that they don't, I think it's important for me to be able to say to parents and for the committee to be able to say to the community that um, we will be able to maintain kindergarten services as we know them. So the first part of, of this solution is already embedded within the um, proposed budget. You remember one of the budget assumptions we made coming into this was that the current 9C cuts would become permanent. That's about $20,000. Um, as I've said before, the one thing, we, we thought that was a conservative estimate. We really did not um, imagine that the, the grant would be eliminated in its entirety. But the good part is 20000 of the 90000 is sort of already baked into the pie of the proposal we made. Next, um, we would change um, half of a maintenance position at, at Leeds School, or we charge uh, half of the maintenance position at Clark School to the revolving account. Um, <coughs> revolving funds need to be used for the purpose for which they're collected. Um, the Clark revolving fund in, includes general um, use of the building. Currently, our uh, maintenance staff does not charge back Clark for any of the um, maintenance services they provide. So we think this is an acceptable and appropriate use of the grant of the Clark money. Um, so our, our proposal would be to just change where we're charging half of a maintenance position from our budget to the Clark revolving account. Next, um, we would charge additional teacher salaries to preschool revolving. Um, we have an anticipated balance at the end of the year of about $80,000 in the preschool revolving account. Um, so if we charge additional preschool teacher salaries to that revolving account, that will free up funds that we could use for kindergarten salaries. Um, that one I feel a little bit less comfortable about than the other ones because, you know, it is in a sense a budget trick and it's not something we can uh, account uh, rely upon over the long run, but I think in the short term, it's a good solution for maintaining kindergarten. Next, um, we would leave one maintenance vacancy unfilled. We're anticipating two retirements in maintenance this summer, and our proposal would be to leave one of them unfilled. Um, it, you notice that we're only, say, uh, accounting for 16,000 there, because we don't believe we can recoup the entire cost of that position. If we um, reduce the number of maintenance staff, we anticipate that we'll have increased overtime costs for maintenance. So we would save part of the position and put part of the position into increased overtime for maintenance staff. Um, then we would reduce kindergarten expenses. Currently, um, currently about $20,000 of supplies for kindergarten is paid for out of the grant, but we could charge those supplies to the building supply accounts, which we've now built into the budget. Um, it would mean less funding for other grade levels, but um, I think it has to be part of the solution we come to here in order to have the minimum impact on kids. <coughs> and then um, we'd eliminate the elementary curriculum writing stipends. There's $1,000 in each school. We're anticipating additional funds in Title II, which we can use for professional development, and curriculum writing qualifies as professional development. So that is really just moving those expenses into kindergarten, or moving them to the grant to free them up for kindergarten. Now, if we do this, I would want to prioritize refilling the maintenance vacancy. I don't think that leaving that position vacant is um, ideal by any means. I think it's um, something we could do in order to deal with this, this need that we're facing right now. Um, but I, if we run into any luck in terms of having this House or Senate replace any of money for kindergarten or increase the Chapter 70 amount, that our first priority would be to um, fund that maintenance position. If we do have luck in the, in the state budget, it's not likely to come until the end of June anyways. Um, so we would be able to do a more typical replacement over the summer, um, probably having just a short gap between the time when the retirement becomes effective and when we'd be able to um, fill it with a new position. And 
While we're talking about this plan, I wanted to introduce um, someone to you. This is Tony Kay. Um, he's the, he's the uh, person who's taking over for Greg Kohan. Um, he's someone who's discussed this plan with me and is able to answer any questions you might have on that um, before moving on. Dr. Provost, could I, could I ask you just, um, sure. just for the public, because um, just if you could maybe just explain the sort of the history of, of kindergarten funding, the state requirement, and, and sort of how this grant came into being, and, and um, just, just to give people a background about why, why, why we and so many other districts have these grants. Sure. So um, <coughs> kindergarten is a grade which technically is not required for students to attend. Um, it's required for districts to offer kindergarten, but it's not a requirement to provide full day kindergarten. Um, this grant was initially um, put into the budget to encourage <coughs> districts to develop full day kindergartens and to maintain full day kindergartens because the benefits of full day care are, are so strongly supported in research. Um, so, you know, it, it's really discouraging for me to see funding for the kindergarten um, being removed from the budget because this is one of the best places the state could invest its educational dollars. It's, and I, yeah, okay, well, thank you for that background. Sure. I haven't really heard much from the Secretary of Education or the Governor about why this was chosen or what the background on it is. So I'll, we'll look forward to hearing what the House and Senate do with it. Um, sure. sure. How, um, how are we setting this up? If you have questions or need to ask them now regarding each one, or do you want us to wait until after the whole presentation and sit back down and ask? Um, I, however you would, I, I think if the superintendent's willing, we could ask questions sure. if they're any, this is a frequently asked questions presentation, so it might be easier to, to ask the questions on each one. Well, uh, sure. All right, um, you brought up the reduced kindergarten expenses and purchase necessities for building-based budgets. Um, so would it just be the elementary schools then supporting, helping to support the kindergarten? Yes. Okay. So it wouldn't go throughout all of the grades to help support that. No. Okay. okay. Another question is why are athletic costs increasing so much? Um, and there was a little bit of confusion around the position of director. Uh, I inferred from one of the questions that I had received that um, there was a a perception that we were increasing the director's position from part-time to full-time within uh, going from FY15 to FY16 and that is an incorrect um, presumption. The athletic director position was actually made full-time this year. Um, it was made full-time for the FY15 budget. The only issue is the funds were not increased to the extent to uh, recognize a full-time position. Uh, the director's salary was increased, um, but it was increased um, from an amount in the low 40s to the amount you see there, 48785 The actual uh, cost of a full-time director's salary came in at 65819 So we're short in that account in the current year. The other um, area where we're short in the current year um, to an, a market degree is transportation. We've budgeted $25,000 for transportation for athletics this year. Our anticipated cost for transportation for athletics this year is $65,000. Um, if you look at the total um, difference between what we've budgeted and what our, we anticipate our cost to be for the current year's athletic budget is about $70,000. Um, our total program budget is 207570 Our anticipated cost is 275000 give or take. We're just starting the spring season right now, so some of that um, is still a little bit squishy, but essentially, um, there was additional money, as I said, at the end of every year infused into athletics. It was a place where uh, money was often put as kind of seed money, knowing there's not enough 
in the budget to uh, run the athletic program. And if it were not from what was known as a bonus um, year where extra money was given to athletics, we would be out of money right now and we wouldn't be running spring sports. Um, so the increase that you see in the FY16 athletic budget is really there um, just to reflect the true costs of running a program instead of intentionally under budgeting and then hoping to find funds at the end of the year to, to pay all the bills. And this doesn't include the booster club's um, contribution to the sports or does? It does include. So um, if you, if you just look at the total cost of all the athletic programs, it's over 400000 But when you back out um, the booster contributions and the contributions from other sources, the amount that's left for the district to raise is closer to 275000 Okay, well, the different booster clubs represent the different clubs and the, the different sports. So would that be one of the reasons why um, some of the sports have more money in them? Um, when people are asking about the inequities in the sports, um, is that one of the reasons why? Is because the booster clubs make more money for that sport? Well, <clears throat> I guess I, I've, we've all received a lot of emails today regarding the inequities in the budget. It's, it's something that I think when, when we're, we're getting those emails, what people are talking about is the difference in pay of coaches' salaries. Because when you look at how the, the sports are treated, in my view, they're all treated very similar. There's the cost to run the sport, and then there's the amount that can be offset by either athletic fees or boosters, and then there's the remaining amount. In our budget, the remaining amount is fully funded by the district for every sport, and every sport has the same fee structure. The only thing that may be inequitable is we have a higher fee for hockey, but the rest of the sports are treated the same with respect to that. Now, the issue of salaries for coaches is completely different than the issue of what we're budgeting um, for sports right now, because this budget does not set the coaches' salaries. This budget just funds the salaries at the amounts that are listed in the contract. Um, so one of the things that I've been um, trying to clarify for parents and I will clarify for the public is um, we have to pay the contracted amount to all of our coaches. And the one that comes up, I think, um, most specifically with respect to this is Ultimate Frisbee. Um, one of the issues is the contract has no amount for Ultimate Frisbee coaches right now. So the only um, amount we can find within the contract that we can apply in any way is the extracurricular sports. Now, Ultimate Frisbee is not truly extra. I mean, not intramural sports. Ultimate Frisbee is not truly intramural, but it is a non-defined sport coach position. So we feel it's close enough to say, okay, we can pay that. Um, but this is, this is not unlike the issue that we grappled with last week with the freshman, um, freshman baseball coach. The, the issue is that the coaches, regardless of who's paying for them, whether it's boosters, whether it's athletic fees, whether it's coming out of the appropriation, the coaches are employees of the school committee. And the only one who can set their, their rates of pay is the school committee. And the only way they can do that is through the contract. Um, I do have one more question. Sure. Um, as far as the transportation, and you were talking about equity, going back to the ultimate frisbee, but you can take any of them. Ultimate frisbee, one of the numbers I got today, at least one, state that there might be, there's transportation problems from not having a field to not being able to get to that field. Is that also um, similar, similar with other sports have, you know, the people, have, the team has to get there on their own and there's no bus in transportation or fields are provided? I guess I might have to ask Kara, who's here, to speak to that issue. I do know that we put money in this proposed budget for transportation for Ultimate Frisbee. So I don't know if you have any insight on that. Okay. I think the transportation costs that, um, that, you, that you may have been hearing about is in relationship to um, transportation for practices and I was able to 
work with Joy Winnie today um, and to, to discover that there's a bus route that goes up by the Ray Ellerbrook fields that um, our kids can get on right after school and be brought up pretty close to the Ray Ellerbrook fields to be able to get dropped off. Um, we decided to use Ray Ellerbrook as the primary field space for Ultimate Frisbee because they have such a large program and because they're currently uh, in years past had been using JFK but had had to sort of compete with space for um, for the baseball programs as well so we decided to use Ray Ellerbrook Field as their primary field and have been able to um, work with Joy Winnie to get that transportation at no cost it's part of the busing that sort of is already happening um, kids will get off at um, Chapel Street and Laurel Street, I believe, um, and we'll just have to walk a short distance up to Ray Ellerbrook. That happens um, with our baseball team and our tennis teams, and in the fall, our soccer teams uh, all going to JFK when they have practice at the, um, at the JFK fields. They'll get on our buses uh, right after school, and they'll just take the bus to JFK, get dropped off here, and then their parents will pick them up after practice. Other transportation is part of their budget. So um, if they're going to Amherst for an invitational or they're going to um, Greenfield for a, a match or whatever, <coughs> that, that's already included in the numbers that you're seeing. Um, I think, does that help? Well, no, it helps an awful lot. It helps to address a lot of the issues that were um, addressed in the question that it may just be the perception from which they're going to use if it does happen to all the different sports. So I'm glad that you addressed that because that definitely is an issue that people are wondering. There is a limitation, though, because Joy Winnie tells me how many spots she has on those buses available for transportation. So I spoke to the coaches today and shared with them that I have 15 spots on that on the bus for them, and that's the same thing for tennis or for um, or for baseball or for soccer. That she tells me how many spots are available on the buses that are already going to those places, and then student athletes and their parents submit a bus pass request form if they don't already take the school bus, um, and it's based on uh, first come first serve. So that's how we've been doing it to try and get folks to other fields. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure. I think Ms. Fallon had a question next. Um, I'm just curious, how much, like I see that we're budgeting and that sometimes what we budget isn't close to the anticipated cost. How much does the budget fluctuate? But So I know our budget is based on gate receipts and certain things that we can't anticipate. And I wonder like how far in advance are schedule set so you know exactly where they're going and when and which how much busing they need you know or a team that's successful and has a lot of postseason play have we accounted for transportation for that so it really it's just a question of do we always expect there to be some fluctuation and is there a way to budget it like we have other accounts where you don't spend the money until it's already till the following year do you know sure. what I'm saying like yeah. we do with other things so you know exactly how much money you have to work with we we don't know exactly there's a couple of unknowns in here, which is what you project when you're doing the budget. <coughs> Karen and I spent a lot of time on the budget this year. It was new to her as well as new to me here. The revenues are estimates. There's detail in there on how the estimates were arrived at, but there could be more kids getting waivers on fees. The Somebody could have a bad team and the gate receipts are down. So if you look at um, the cover sheet, shall I say, on the athletic budget in the binder, the estimated revenues as well as the school committee appropriation are actually $10,000 more than the anticipated expenses. And that's for a couple of reasons. The revenue might be low. We'll know what the school committee budget is when we're done this process, but all the gate receipts and the user fees are an estimate. So we could be off on those. Something could happen on the expense end, we could be high or low. So I met with Kara again today and I said, you know, in the perfect world, if you do exactly what's here, you will close the year out with $10,000 in the revolving account that can carry into next year. It's probably not going to be a perfect world because we're not going to get exactly that amount on user fees and gate receipts. So as we were developing this, we had that in mind. Kara did her best estimate on the expenses based on looking back at what happened last year. We're tracking this in much more detail than it's been tracked in the past, so we do expect over the next few years there's going to be some shuffling. We'd love to get money into uniforms. There's nothing budgeted right now for uniforms, and if it turns out that some of our numbers are off, we might be able to redirect budget money the following year into the uniform account. Go ahead, Ann. Um, I'm going to go back to ultimate mm -hmm. for a second. It sounds <coughs> to me like, so the question of, what, of putting it into this kind of ambiguous intramural sport because it's not 
written in the contract? Is, a, is it because it's not an MIAA? No, it's just because it's not in the contract. The contract uh, okay. really doesn't um, sp have a different classification for MIAA coaches okay. and non-MIAA so coaches. So putting it in that, why not just put it in the regular coaching budget? Like, why, what because, was that decision? Because when you look in the um, actual stipends that are listed specifically in the contract, they say things like okay. lacrosse coach, basketball coach, football coach. Okay. And, and they're all different amounts. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about this slide? I just wanted to follow up again on Ann's question. Um, when I had talked with the superintendent earlier, you had stated that there were five coaches for ultimate frisbee. I mean, because there is an amount that they're getting. Five right or four. Now. Okay, yeah. four or five. But there's an amount that they're getting right now, but it's not based on the um, contract. What's that, the amount that they're getting right now based on? It is based on the contract. It's based on that intramural coach's rate. Okay, so not JV, not right. freshman, not. Okay. And that's again because when you have JV teams listed in the contract, they're listed as specific teams. Every team more or less has a different rate. So, with our next negotiations coming up, I'm not on the budget team, so maybe a silly question, but is that where, who would, who would bring that up? Would we would, 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 would the teachers, I mean, you would bring it up? Who would bring that up, that little, it seems so little. Yeah, my understanding is that when the contract was closed, obviously it was before I was here, the um, issue of stipends was kind of still hanging out there. So I think that could be resolved <coughs> or begin to be worked on at any time. I think it would be good to start working on it because it, it rears its head in so many places. Okay, and then another question on athletics was, could you give, just give an example of what are included in athletic supplies expenses and general expenses? Um, so the general expenses are essentially your fees, league fees, field maintenance, CPR, coaches, training, concussion evaluation, software. Um, supplies are sports items with a unit price of less than $5,000. It's uh, kind of a uh, accounting terminology difference between supplies and other expenses. And the other expenses are greens fees is probably the biggest one and other sports specific costs. So then um, a question that has been asked actually from early on in my time in the district is do we have the optimal mix of contracted in district owned buses. As you know, um, we have sort of a hybrid system. We have three buses that we own and operate on our own, and then we contract out to Durham for the rest of our services. Now, the services that we're providing with our own buses, they're, they're wheelchair buses, so I'm calling them vans for the sake of keeping them separate from the other types of buses. Um, our average per tier cost for to operate our own buses is about $59. That's a daily rate. The average per tier cost we're paying contracted out is $95. Um, so based on this, um, it looks like there may be some additional cost avoidance that could be gained if we expanded our fleet for special education um, transportation. Does that now, $59 include maintenance as well? It does. It does, okay. And fuel? Uh, Yes, it, it, it's inclusive of all costs associated with that. Um, but that's a good question because my caveat, my reason why I have to look at this um, a little bit more closely before I make a, a more firm determination on how large the fleet could grow to is our cost avoidance um, is a slope with a negative line that, that goes down in a linear fashion. Our costs um, to run the buses is more of an exponential um, curve that goes up. And at a certain point, um, the cost of operating your own tiers becomes a lot more than 95, uh, a lot more than $59. The reason why is because at a certain point, um, you have to bring on a dispatcher. At a certain point, you have to bring on a full-time mechanic for every um, bus you have 
you need to have at least a half a backup bus in case it doesn't start in the morning. So the costs grow a little bit faster than the cost savings grows. But it, there may be there may be some room if we expanded our our in district busing a little bit to save on special ed. So we will be looking at that. Plus capital replacement. You'll yes. You have to factor in fleet replacement. Right. right. So when we looked at this, uh, we looked at the cost of. This is just our existing fleet. Um, when we would do a projection for expanding the fleet, and that's one of the things that comes into the next slide we're going to talk about in a minute, um, our, our method was we amateurized the cost over 10 years. Now, that's something obviously we would have to collaborate with the city on because I don't believe the school committee can go out to bond and buy its own buses. But th if there is a plan and it was feasible, I'd certainly bring it to you to. Uh, you have to have uh, a really big bake sale. Yes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, are there any questions on special ed transportation before we move on to the second part of this? Do you feel that there's anything that we can do better? Do you feel that right now, with given what we are and where we are, that we are at an optimal state? Well, I guess my answer to this is maybe not. We might be able to save a little bit more money if we did a little bit more of our own transportation for special ed, but it will require your, some more research because I have to look at that expense side of the curve as well and see if, if we grow it by one more, then what does our per tier cost become? I have one more question. Sure. With, with those buses, if we did do that, would those buses be able to be some something to be used to take kids home for a late bus in the afternoon? Or depending on if we decided no busing in the afternoon for have for there to be busing in the afternoon? Um, <clears throat> I guess I would say potentially. It would have to be a very late, late bus though. Um, because all of these buses would be replacing Vanpool transportation that we currently have, which means they wouldn't become available until after they finished dropping kids off at the elementary school, from the elementary school. Okay, um, so then the other side of this is regular ed um, transportation, which I'm just calling buses. Um, right now, our actual cost for the transportation contract on regular education transportation, $628,036. Our estimated cost to um, run a fleet to replace that would be 816856 Now there are some assumptions in here which I need to just point out because we did this analysis pretty quickly when we saw how large the variance was, we realized we didn't, probably didn't make sense to try to fine tune this calculation too much. Um, so we, we assumed we could amateurize the cost of the buses over 10 years. That's a little bit non-standard. Most um, bus companies, my understanding is, they do it over the course of five years. But based on the longevity of the buses that we have within our own fleet, um, it seems like it would be reasonable that we would still be operating them over that entire period. So um, we did use that. It was kind of a, a more favorable estimate, you know, to, to bring down the annual cost. Um, we were only able to find one comparable for a garage estimate. Um, obviously, if we did this out in more detail, we'd want to have at least three comparables. Um, it also assumes that Smith Vocational would bid on its own transportation contract or it would fully reimburse NPS because right now the contract is both NPS and Smith Vocational. Um, and we haven't had that discussion with them. Obviously, we need to have that discussion. Um, and we also had rough estimates used for dispatcher, mechanic, and maintenance um, because we can only infer so much from the types of buses we're maintaining right now. They're not exactly these kinds of buses, so our, our estimates may be off on that a little bit. So there is a point at which you know it may become more cost effective to operate our own fleet for, for regular education transportation, but it seems like that point is a long way off. Um, the, the, the cost of the, the bus contracts uh, would have to grow substantially for it to make more sense for us to bring that in house. Yes. Do other districts around the area have this similar? Do they have their own buses, or did they contract out? So the only um, district I'm aware of, sort of locally, that does their own buses is Munson. Um, typically, um, districts find that it's less costly to to uh, 
to contract it out. And it's because if you look at that last line of um, types of workers that we're trying to give estimates on, those become your employees instead of the contractor's employees. So right now, you know, we have a dispatcher, but our Durham is also servicing three other major contracts. So we're really, in essence, paying a quarter of the dispatcher. You can't really bring in a dispatcher and say, well, work two hours a day, you know? Okay, thank you. Plus, you'd also have to have a place to store and, and, and some kind of a maintenance facility. I mean, there's yes. other yeah. Yeah. Um, capital costs as well so right and that was our garage estimate yeah. and we found that was a a pretty significant cost um, but you know we looked in a nearby town and I think the estimate on that was something like eighty thousand dollars because it has to be not just a piece of land where you park buses it has to be fenced in it has to have surveillance it has to meet the standards that you need for the insurance that you would have on the buses um, have we ever looked at um, other cities that I've heard of that use the public transportation, like PVTA going along certain lines to be able to, because this isn't a lot of money to get to school if there's other ways that are already available. Well, um, we have not looked at PVTA um, since I've been here. I, I believe there was a time in the past when that was looked into. Um, I can tell you that based on the average, um, average per pupil transportation cost in the state, Northampton has a much lower rate. Um, so, and that doesn't compare us to some regional districts that, that sort of skew the um, rate higher, but it also compares us to some urban districts that skew the rate lower. Um, so I do think while not maybe 100% efficient, our bus, our transportation costs are much lower than the average cost of, of transporting kids. I was just going to mention, I did research the PVTA issue, and I didn't realize that there's a federal trooper rule that would prevent us from being in competition with the Yellow School Bus Company if they're receiving regional funds. So they would be precluded from altering their routes, and it would still have to be a public route, et cetera. So it actually, what's, it seemed initially to me like a simple solution, and there are roadblocks the entire way that end up making it yeah. uh, not very feasible because there are only a couple routes that would actually serve our students. I think all of you. Well, Holyoke, so Holyoke and Springfield, they already have a system where the schools are centrally located and the bus routes that already existed happen to go past them. <coughs> Whereas for us, they would actually have to alter pre-existing bus routes. And once they do that, they're in competition with yellow school bus companies. And there's a whole procedure that you have to follow. Well, with that, but my thing on that one would be, would that include the, the distance? You know, I mean, you don't have to drop them off at the door. You can have a bus stop within a mile and a half or whatever. Yeah, so I did so, look at the routes and it really wasn't, it, their pre -existing we had PBTA not. officials did come in and in one of the earlier late start uh, commission iterations and and discuss these issues and it's very yeah it's I mean certainly kids now could take PBTA if it was convenient but PBTA for example doesn't have a bus that comes to this school which is our largest school population so it's you know there and does it go to other schools in the district so yeah I'm not sure we could base our Trans, our transportation system on that be challenging. So then, um, one thing that's come up is since our last discussion on Late Start is the what I'm going to call the JFK hub model, the idea of having high school students ride with JFK students into JFK and then um, transport back to the high school. Um, so the problem with this, it, there's two problems. One is the original problem, which is the one that I think prevented this, the um, proposal really from ha being fully discussed or recommended to school committee, which is there's no plan for getting the kids home from the high school until after um, other bus routes run. Um, it would require every kid essentially to take the late bus. Um, the other problem is fitting all the kids on the buses that are <coughs> currently going to JFK. Um, so these are the bus routes and what the ridership would be on the combined routes going into JFK based upon actual ridership data that we collected earlier this year. And there are three routes in particular that I've highlighted for you that become problematic. Um, there's what I'm 
what I'm calling the pink route. That one would have 74 kids, um, so that's over the limit of 55. That would require another bus. There's the red route, which would be 66. Again, over the limit, that would require us to put on another bus. And then there's the purple route. Um, that one, I think, is 61. That one, there might be a, a potential solution for. I've circled in the top. There's another route that goes into JFK that we could divert some of the purple kids to. And that, um, that might uh, allow us to avoid having a third additional bus to get all the kids into JFK. Um, that one would be pretty tight too though. If we make that change, which I would say we should do if we did this plan, um, that one would be at 53. So that one would be just about ready to go over and become a third bus as well. Now, you might be able to get a couple more on if we rejiggered a few more things within that purple route. Um, but essentially, you're gonna have to add at least two regular education buses um, maybe three regular education buses. And then you also have to add another special education van because you're having to transport all the kids from grade six up at the same time. Um, so costing that out, um, you've seen charts like this before. The first is our status quo chart, which shows the cost of regular ed and special ed in the current configuration. This is what it would look like um, with the JFK hub model. Um, so this is assuming that we could do that redistricting or rebusing, whatever, whatever the proper better term is, um, to limit the number of uh, regular ed buses, additional buses needed to two. We'd put them on one tier because we don't need them after we get them to JFK. Um, but again, the difference between one tier and two tiers is minimal in terms of cost because the way the contracts work and the way this is explained to districts is most of your cost is getting that bus off the lot in the morning. Um, so saving it as one tier doesn't really save us that much. Um, and then adding the um, one additional van for special education, that on one tier, and on that there is, there is a pretty substantial difference between a one tier cost and a three tier cost. Again, the tier would only be there to take the kids from wherever they are to JFK, then that van would go away until the end of the day. Um, the cost of that total package is $945,941. So the comparison um, from status quo to JFK hub, um, the hub adds, if we just need the two additional regular ed buses, $73,105. But, but like I said, we are right on the cusp of potentially needing a third regular education bus. If we did have to go over to a third bus, then the additional cost would be $135,261. Um, and in all this, you still have the initial problem, which is the problem that um, defeated the proposal in the first place, which is there's no way to get the kids home from the school at the end of the day unless you say they all have to be become late bus riders, essentially. Yes. Yeah. So I had a question um, about, it's basically based on the standalone proposal from a month or so ago. Um, do you remember that? The, yes. It seemed like in that one, the the vans actually cost less than the status quo for the high school. Do you remember? I remember how it was sort of, but the but the buses obviously the three additional yellow buses cost more, and so it netted out to being the the ninety thousand. Oh yes, and in, in no that wasn't standalone. That was the hub model. I think no. Oh, I think, no that was sorry, standalone. No. You're right. That was standalone. Standalone. That was that. You're right. It was standalone. And the reason it was cheaper, it only cost 90000 for three additional buses was because there were some savings on the vans. That's right. So that's why I was wondering, it seems like, it seems like the vans under that proposal would be operating about the same as they would under the JFK hub proposal. And because they'd be running essentially at the same time as JF, you know, which is what they were going to do under the standalone, was going to be essentially at the same time as the JFK routes. Right. And so I'm just wondering if we did, which, <laughs> if, if, the, if there was a mistake on either that calculation for the vans or on this calculation for the vans, or if there's some 
some other detail that I'm not. I think the detail that uh, throws, that makes this different than the other one is there were, two vi there were two vans that were required for the high school anyways, and there are two vans that we currently have servicing the high school. Um, then there are two vans that are required for leads, I believe. Um, so those four were essentially locked up. Um, on this one, you essentially get all those vans available once you get the kids to JFK because they can go to the high school, then come back, and then they're available again. So you're not, you're, you're still running three tiers here with respect to special ed, if you think about it that way, one to JFK, one to the high school, and then one to the elementary. And the other ones you were essentially running one that was on one tier, and the rest of them were on two tiers. I'm still confused, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I think we should look at that, but in, in, I think, you know, the other thing I was thinking about this is that I think we generally decided that we weren't going to spend that much money on, on anything because our real issue is maintaining what we have, um, but that we could look at this, continue to look at, you know, to, to figure out that sort of, those sorts of details to see how they work in the future and it wouldn't really because we'd only do it if it wasn't going to cost our budget more than we would already have budgeted for transportation mm -hmm. is that true i mean that yeah we we can continue to look at different scenarios you know i've looked at a number of different scenarios i think the thing that um the thing that defeats them all so far that i've looked at is when you have kids riding on fewer tiers which is the, the yeah. saving mm -hmm and the way to get the later start, then you need more buses. You know, the, I think the hope was in the, either the original hub model or the JFK hub model was that you had enough additional space on the existing buses to fit all the kids in. Right. You know? And that's, that's the part that just turns out not to work. And you know, one thing also I'll point out about um, the JFK hub model is when that was originally developed, there were 10 buses running, right. so they had one more to work with. Um, so we've already cut that back. So I think you know maybe some of those earlier proposals, if they were based on 10, may, might have worked with 10, but still that means now we're at nine, we have to add at least that bus to get back to that point. And then there are whatever changes happened in ridership between the time the original proposal and where we are now. Right, and I think we also were using more than five buses for the high school, so we had some additional costs. You know. But I had another thing too. I think if you know you ended up with a marginal thing where this is I'm am seeing that seventy three thousand. But for the that that third bus, if it needed a bus, if it was a marginal increase of ten riders, it wouldn't really you wouldn't have to go to another yellow bus. That could be you could it do could that with a van. van or something. It could be a van. Considerably yep. less expensive. You know, yep. we don't need to go by yellow bus integers. We could go by. That's true. Smaller, That's smaller true. integers. That's true. Car uh, sorry, Carrie has a question. Um, I, I think we can argue about the intricacies of how many buses we might need, but <clears throat> in my mind, it's it's unacceptable for kids to be staying at school until four o'clock. So, I mean, I think that's been the deal killer all the way through, and I think that is kind of just getting pushed to the side. Like, well, those kids can just go home at four, and in my opinion, that's not acceptable. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and. We can't just forget those kids. And so even if all of this other stuff can be figured out, we still have that. Well, if I might? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that's true. That's, that's a problem with our current system, too. We can't forget the kids who have to leave immediately after school and do not have time to you know, go to a teacher for help. Um, and we, but we do, because we can't <laughs> afford to run the bus right after school and a late bus. Or maybe we could. I mean, I don't know. That'd be something to look at because we're currently with our tiers, we're running five buses. And possibly we could, you know, because delivery home, you don't have to run the whole route. You can run the parts of the route. You know, you just stop at the stops you need to. And it's not like in the morning where you have to go to every stop. So it might be possible in the afternoon to take our five buses that we use in high school and split that tier somehow so that we had some buses that left right after school and some buses that left you know, say it, what right now would be three o'clock. 
or something like that. So, so anyway, there's things to look at to take advantage of those. But I, I, I hear your point, but I'm saying it's our current system does that too to a different group of kids. Well, <coughs> I would say that that group of kids is probably much smaller than the entire group of kids who takes the bus home. Kids that want to stay for late help that might not be getting it as opposed to every single kid that has to take the bus home. Fall, I have just a question based on that. The, um, have you ever done a survey based on um, the kids? I mean, I know when I was in high school, I wanted to be a late bus, and there wasn't, and it made it very difficult because I ended up having to walk home <coughs> anyway. And I didn't get my homework assignments half the time because my bus left at like one minute after it was the first bus on everything. Have you done a survey of how many kids now are like I was stuck in that position or and would like? It to be a change, and how many really need it to maintain here it is? Sure. Uh, to my knowledge, we haven't done a survey, but I will tell you that in the many hours, days, and months of discussions that I've spent on transportation, I did ask the high school principal, how come you never asked for a late bus in any of these discussions? And the response was, we could really use a late bus. In fact, we asked for it year after year after year, but we stopped asking because we could never afford it. So I think from the perspective of the high school administration on the basis of that answer, and also just on the basis of my experience with other districts, if we had a late bus, it would be a benefit for kids. Okay, and the state law states that we have to transport kids up until what? We don't have to transport high school, and not that I'm That's at right. all saying we shouldn't, but we don't have to transport. Um, so in that way, for me, it seems like if we took a survey and found out, you know, how many kids that we're actually talking about that wouldn't, it wouldn't work for them to take away from us. Because I guess realistically, they could all of them have to find their own way home because we don't really owe them that. So I'm just saying maybe we owe them to ask everybody mm -hmm. what works best for you. Mm -hmm. you know? can follow up with the principal on that. Thank you. Mr. Meyer. Um, so my question is looking farther in the future, you brought up the alternatives of trying to develop a fleet in mm -hmm. district which seems extraordinarily costly and has um, <coughs> a lot more work in terms of figuring out how the capital expenses would be dealt with. But how many years will we be able to afford, for instance, high school busing? Because we were, before the last override, at a point where we just eliminated it. We couldn't afford it. And I mean, looking at the district's extent, even with the extended stability plan, we do begin sort of to dip below, below the line um, in 2017, and our bus contract expires in 2018. And I know that in budget property, we had a conversation about some districts being faced with not the four to six percent escalation that we have now, but double digit 15, 16 percent. And I guess just in terms of planning, um, we, I don't just want to make sure that we don't think that we're looking at status quo here. Um, that probably within three, four years, we're going to have to consider either drastically cutting back or reconfiguring in some way that saves a substantial amount of money. So on those charts, there are those little blue arrows that say decision. I don't know what the decisions will be, but you're, you're right. At, unless we're able to increase revenue or find some way to cut costs, we are going to reach a point where we don't fit our budget anymore. We had kind of met that before the override, and right now we're discussing um, not having transportation for kids to come home, but we had all, unfortunately, pretty much said that they were going to have no high school transportation at all, mm -hmm. had there not been an override. So I, mean, I would really urge us to consider looking at the late box or something that can work so that they get what they need. I want them to get to school. And I want them to get home, too, but with opportunities right now at, you know, whenever it gets immediately off. They don't have the opportunity for a lot of the <coughs> clubs, after school questions, mm -hmm. just being part of the school culture. Mm -hmm. Ms. Walzer. To touch on the issue, if I was following it correctly earlier on the late bus issues, right now we're running five high school buses around the city and the, the buses are barely making it, and I understand in some cases they're making it late to the middle school. If we were to decide that three of those were going to run at dismissal time and two were going to run after an elementary route, you've then taken three buses that have to cover the whole city. You've added 10, 15, 20 minutes to each of those routes, therefore making them that much later to the middle school. It's a, it's a tight balancing act now, and that would just complicate it more, and that's one of the downsides of having tiers. Tiers save you money, 
tiers don't give you a lot of flexibility in terms of the times, unless you want kids getting home at 5 o'clock at night. So. Another um, issue that we've grappled with is why are the cost of utilities increasing so much? Um, one of the things that um, we were a little unclear on within the estimate recommended by central services for next year is what the source of the increase was. Um, at, we've had about three meetings with central services since the time the budget was first proposed to get greater clarity, one, and to make sure that the estimates were good estimates, two. Um, we kind of narrowed it down to it's really electricity. Um, there was an increase in electricity and there was an increase in gas, um, but there was a decrease in telephones and a decrease in um, wastewater that essentially offset the cost in gas. So um, it, it's really the electricity that's driving this. So the current year, we've experienced a 32% average increase. I it's say average because we actually had two rate increases in our electric this year. Um, so we're short, we're short in the accounts for electricity this year. I think we're probably going to be about $50,000 short on our accounts for electricity in the current year. Um, fortunately, we have that over budgeting in the ESP salary, so we'll have some money that we can use to um, pay the electric bills when we get to June. Um, but that, that's one piece of this increase. Next year, I think just based on a realistic model, we have to assume there'll be a 15% increase. Um, and then we also are going out to bid next year. So just like we had two rates this year, we're going to have two rates next year. And I think we have to leave some room within our budget if those bids come in t to the point where um, the year next year is more like the year we had this year. Um, so anyways, we have met several times and confirmed this number with central services. This is the number they're recommending we go with and so it's a number that I think needs to be in the budget. Um, it's not a mistake, it's really the amount of increases we've seen. I'll say I, that 32% was even though our consumption went down this year. Um, well, prices are going down as a vapor. Those, those are residential. Those are <coughs> residential. So, so we weren't affected by it going up when we're not going to be affected by it going back down? We were, we were affected by something going up, um, not, not exactly that same, that same cost structure, but we're, we're not going to reap any benefit from that reduction. Wow. We go out to bid for electric, we, we, we bid on the open market for electrical for our electrical rate, so we go out, and so that's, that's the process we follow. So we try to we, we go for what the best price is available for those who bid on it. So, so another question related to utilities is: Can we be more efficient? Um, I've had an opportunity to collaborate a little bit with Chris Mason, who is the Energy and Sustainability Officer for Northampton. <coughs> so this is a direct quote from him. He says, in short, probably yes. Um, while the city has implemented extensive energy efficient measures by investing in high energy HVAC and building maintenance systems and high efficiency lighting controls, there may be further opportunities through behavior changes, such as limiting the use of lights when the daylight is available, turning off computers and office equipment when not needed, etc. cetera. Um, so we do have a meeting coming up with Chris to see if um, he could maybe recommend some high impact behavior changes that we could recommend to our staff. Um, but I, I just want to reiterate, we saw those increases this year even though our consumption went down because we were being more efficient. I don't think that you know, having teachers be more conscious of when their lights are on in the classroom is going to make a big dent in the electric, but we'll do the best we can. We do have one, I mean, one positive thing potentially on the horizon, which is we are about to go out to bid for a, um, to, for firms to, to build a photovoltaic array on our landfill. Um, and we are looking to, and some other parking lots around the city. And 
conservative estimates say we, if we were to do that, the, the arrays in terms of the sizing we're looking at could could help us save significantly on our city-wide electric costs. So, but that's that's you know two two years away, two or three years away. But I mean, ironically, we spent about four or five years lowering our overall energy costs by 20 percent, um, and then. Now we've had all these uh, increases in uh, in the rates that have occurred, um, and so thank goodness we did those energy improvements, right. or we'd be looking at much higher rates th than we're paying now. So I think I'm confused about that program that you enrolled in the Con Edison Solutions, where they guarantee the savings. Yeah, that lowered it. So they they aren't guaranteeing a, a dollar number. They're only guaranteeing that we're using less energy. They're guaranteeing the they are guaranteeing the savings, um, but they're not guaranteeing what the energy rates are going to be. You know, they can't guarantee. You say what savings. The, that's kind of what I'm saying. So savings meaning consumption. 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 Okay. That's right. So that's kind of because you exactly. said they'll reimburse. It says that they'll reimburse yeah. us for for the difference, and so it's not for the actual price. It's for our usage. Exactly. You know what I'm saying like, does that yeah. program? adjust to reflect the increased cost of electricity or no? Not no. really. No, it's all about it's about the therms and the kilowatts and the other things. And so all the control systems, all the conversion to high efficiency boilers, all the other pieces are all about those reducing the total number of therms and <laughs> the total number of kilowatts that we're, we're using. Okay. It can't control the price per kilowatt or the price per therm. Right, but so. it's just hard. It's hard for me to understand that they're reimbursing us if we're not meeting our savings goals on energy. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, yeah. what rate are they reimbursing us? Was kind of the question. Was it the rate? Did they set the rate, or is the rate the market rate? Uh, I can get you more information about that. Okay, yeah. I was just curious yeah. if they're reimbursing us yeah. reflected this increase. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would sign that. Well, well, well I'll, I'll find the, uh, I'll get you the clearer information on that. <clears throat> so another question that came up oh. to this point is should we look into energy production again from Chris, who we'll be meeting with shortly. Um, the opportunities are limited. Um, there may be um, some something we can do with school parking lots. Um, there may be some canopies with photovoltaic cells that we could add, but um, it's, it has been it has been investigated, and Chris doesn't feel that there are, um, are, is much left in terms of energy production on school properties. There's somebody here who comes quite often and speaks quite often about different issues, and they she has their family has redone their whole entire home, and they to the point <coughs> they sell the electricity back to the company. I mean, and that's a that's a have we looked at that? I understand that's what you're saying. Have we looked at being able to do it like massively or just out in the parking lots? So I haven't actually met with Chris yet, but this is a snippet from an email he sent me. My, um, my understanding from this is that they did the surveys and found that not the sites we have are just not conducive to production. Um, but can you? Or, or the, the second okay. piece of that, because it was one of the conversations <coughs> I had during our meetings. Because um, Hampshire County Cobb did this countywide, uh, sure. uh, and one of the other issues they ran into is the structural integrity of the building and putting that weight on. So you've got membrane roofs, which is one issue, and then you've got the weight of those units that would be adding it, and there would have to be structural studies involved. And the initial thinking was that some of the buildings wouldn't be able to hold that additional weight. Okay. So another question was, should we expand preschool to other s sites? Uh, one thing I want to make you aware of is the uh, early education department is currently uh, in the midst of a birth to grade three initiative, trying to marry up what's happening in the public preschool world, the private preschool world, and the K-12 world um, to try to make a, a seamless um, integrated model from birth to grade three. And so uh, I am currently on a, uh, participating in a leadership institute with the private preschool providers in town, as well as Barbara Black, who represents our own public preschool program. And um, in, 
our feeling from our initial discussions, we've been together for about two days so far, is that the greatest barriers we face right now are not really the availability of space within programs, but um, transportation, really, um, it's access. Transportation, particularly from some parts of the city that are sort of uh, preschool deserts, if you will, places where if you don't have a car, there's no um, preschool program, either public or private, that you can get your kids to. Um, Leeds, I think, is particularly um, difficult for that. Or the other barriers are affordability. Um, so um, I don't know where all that will lead, um, but I do think that rethinking preschool probably does make sense. Um, so one of the things we're doing as part of this collaboration next year is trying to partner up with Head Start program at Vernon Street by providing some of our staff to the Vernon Street facility. That will help us in a couple of ways um, and it will help the families in a couple of ways. Um, one of the issues that Head Start families face right now is they're eligible for a Head Start program, often with a voucher, but they also have special needs. Um, so then they're faced with the question of, do they enroll in the public preschool and um, have their child's special needs addressed, or do they use their Head, vouch, head Start voucher and have the heart, Head Start program? Um, and it's a very difficult choice to ask families to make, in part because our preschool program is half day and Head Start is full day. Um, so that's a real conundrum that families are facing. We think that we can provide some of our staff to Head Start. It would not increase our costs. It would free up some space within our private preschool because families would not necessarily have to make the decision to bring their kids to the preschool. Um, they could receive their services at Vernon Street. and. Um, it would also help us with another issue we're facing, which is lack of peers. Um, as, as you know, integrated preschool programs are based on a 50-50 model. Essentially 50% plus one student needs to be a typical, typically developing peer. And for the last two years in a row, we've had to ask for waivers from the state on that requirement because we can't enroll enough peers. Um, so many of the kids at Head Start um, are experiencing some challenges, but not necessarily developmental challenges or disabilities, they could count as peers for us and allow us to um, address that, that problem we have in our preschool program right now. So um, I guess the short answer to that very long-winded <laughs> thing is yes, um, we are looking to expand preschool next year a little bit um, with Vernon Street, and we're in discussions for what we can do to really make sure that all the residents of Northampton have the ability to participate in a preschool program for their child. Um, I think that will be a mix of probably expanded public and better coordinated private, um, but more to come on that. Yes. I guess the other, it sounds like the other question is, should we be looking into expanding to a full day versus, as opposed to changing more sites, just at the site we're at, you know, expanding the length of the day? I think a full day program would definitely help with our peer issue. I think the reason we don't get more typical peers is because there are full day options available to them, um, and they're more convenient for families. Of course, the, there are two issues with ex expanding hours. One is it will cost more money because essentially you're doubling the staff if you're doubling the time. And we'd also need twice as much space. Um, the space issue would probably be easier to resolve, but it would run us smack into another problem. Um, the logical place to put a, an expanded preschool program would be Ryan Road, but Ryan Road has a space for a Head Start program right now, which would probably be the space we would need. So, um, it, it, yes, we should go for a, a more extended preschool program, but I don't know how to get there where we are, with the limitations we have right now. But the discussion is ongoing. Why would Ryan Road be um, the most? Because of the, because of the availability of space, which right now is Head Start space, which is already set up as a preschool, and because it provides something on the other side of town. So it addresses, you know, that is also, if it wasn't for the Head Start program, it would be another preschool desert. 
we are we going to be collaborating? You mentioned the Vern industry. Are we going to be doing that at, our, at the Ryan Road Head Start also? They're it's the same director. They're part of that collaboration. Okay, so it's not just the Vern industry. Yes. Um, so. What exactly does the dual enrollment line cover? So in the high school budget, there's $5,500 that pays for students to attend courses at HCC or GCC. That amount is about enough to cover 40 classes. This is really a dropout prevention strategy. Um, there are some older high school students who will be able to get a diploma but not if we make them do it through the high school. Um, there are just certain situations that occur in the lives of some kids where it makes more sense for them to take their courses at HCC or GCC than to try to do it in the high school. Many times these are kids who are out of, out of age for their grade or they have other life situations that make it difficult for them to be in school during the typical high school day. Um, so students who are at risk of dropping out be, are referred by their guidance counselor if, if the feeling is we can get them to the finish line of a diploma if we would enroll them in HCC or GCC to finish up their coursework. So that's what that program is. A question to that? Mm -hmm. while, I, while I support that program, you said that it was to get them to their diploma. I was also under the understanding it was to go beyond that just to help them a help to say yes you can become a college student and also to show that, that confidence as far as just that. So. Well these are dual enrollment courses so the, the benefit for those students is not only are they finishing up the credits they need for high school graduation but they're also accumulating some some college credits and you're right you know it, it I've known more than a handful of students who felt like they weren't being successful at the high school and weren't being successful in a high school program who just sort of flourished when they got to a college setting. So, um, but it's this very specific profile and that's really controlled by the high school guidance counselor. So that's what that line is. <coughs> and then, uh, so how was the change in the writing course reflected in the budget? Um, so I think it's important to know that the FY budget has 48 sections of English and 58 sections of math. One section of each of those is remedial this year. For FY16, we still have 48 sections of English and 58 sections of math. The number of the remedial sections is yet to be determined. Um, but I think this graph suggests where it could possibly go. Um, you know, I've been talking about in many forums, including the entry findings, that we have higher numbers of high need students coming into the, the district. It doesn't necessarily mean that all high need students are low performing students, but um, if you look at the difference between the current 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders and the incoming 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, it's a pretty dramatic difference. Um, now, we do have that sort of mixing of populations that occurs between 8th and ninth grade and I've looked back a couple of years to sort of see what that accounts for and it, it seems like it tamps down the 8th grade high needs percentage by about 10 percent but you can see so in two years that 7th grade will be coming into ninth grade and so maybe if they're 40 percent you can see that's still substantially higher than the grades the high needs in the grades that are currently being served by the high school. Um, so I think it is reasonable to assume, although it's not a, um, definite, that within those 48 sections of English <coughs> and 58 sections of math, we may need to increase the number of remedial, um, but that's to be determined. So um, that's, and I, my understanding is that was part of the reason for <coughs> embedding the writing within English was to create more sections of English overall that you have more flexibility with. Yes? Well, from looking at this, the 9, 10, 11, and 12 are considerably less um, for, for the percentage of high-need students than the upcoming grades. Um, is, do some of those kids ultimately go off to student vote and we're losing some of the percentage that way? Or perhaps maybe we are diagnosing and taking care? That seems just like a trend 
it is it is a trend in there. The first and second and third and fourth grade. I mean, it, yep. it goes all the way through. Something yep. was was it there's two things that happen we have some attrition from our population that occurs between eight and nine much of that is due to Smith um, though, though not all and then we have new kids who enter in who tend to be less representative of high needs group than the kids who have been with our system through the whole way so the mixture of kids leaving and new kids coming in causes the number, you know, the, the overall percentage to decline. But as I said, sort of my best estimate is that it may take it down 10%. If you take any of these, you know, below the current eighth grade down 10%, they're still a lot higher than the ones that are in 9 through 12 right now. Um, so I have, you know, had many discussions with Chris and with uh, Brian about trying to gear up and get ready for the population that um, is about to matriculate into <coughs> high school. And I know that one of Mr. Brennan's goals this year is to try to find more ways to support at-risk freshmen. And I think that's a, it's a goal that's right on target because I, I think there are going to be um, higher numbers of at-risk freshmen coming in the next few years. Can we expect more? I mean, for it to go down, I'm still stuck on going down like that. And, and for all the upcoming years that we can see, it's very, very high. So uh, we haven't looked at it differently or, or we've adjusted the criteria. It's just all of a sudden we have these eight years of, of students having higher needs. Well, remember, we're not, these are criteria, most of which are not defined by the school. Um, the first is eligibility for free or reduced lunch. So that's, you know, just a reflection, I think, of the economic need within the community. The other is um, first language, not English. And we know our ELL population is growing, so um, I think that is certainly not anything that the, di the school is doing by identification or misidentification. The other group that's included in that is special education. And I do think there's some over-identification there, but I think it's an over-identification that is um, spread throughout K-12. to I don't think it's happening only at the early levels. Um, in fact, one of the surprising, um, surprising numbers that I learned just this week is that we've had over 90 initial evaluations at the high school this year. Um, which doesn't make any sense because unless something traumatic has happened in the development of the child, it's extremely unlikely that a child would develop a disability for the first time in the 9th, 10th, 11th, or 12th grade. So, um, Can any of that be reflected by a curriculum change that we were doing, you know, we had one writing program and then we changed it and it's not as successful? That be accounted for that? Some of the special education could hypothetically be in, uh, accounted for by that. I'm not going to say that I'm definite on that, um, but one of the one of the criteria that you need to meet in order to be eligible for special education is that you're not making effective progress, which is typically measured by your performance compared to peers in a national sample. So if you had an ineffective curriculum, you would expect more kids to show up as not making effective pro progress. Right. And I have one more question on that. Um, sure. I know one, one, but with the change in autism identification going up, now being what, one in 68, do you, would that be attributed to any of the, to the highness of those? I would say that that uh, might be playing in a little bit to the numbers in first, second, and third grade. Um, that is that is one of the most frightening statistics out there, I think. Um, but it's my understanding is those are children who are currently being born now, um, so they're, they're young kids. The the students who are in twelfth grade were, you know, I remember <laughs> when. Those kids were in sixth grade, and someone said that it had gone down to one in 150. And people were like, wow, what's going on? Now it's one in less than 70. So um, I'm not sure what's happening. And that definitely is reflected in the high needs group because students with disabilities is one of the categories. When you presented something a while ago, recently, looking at uh, charter schools in the area and the significant lower numbers or percentage rather of special needs, mm -hmm. low income, the whole high needs right here. To me that makes sense then if you're having a 
24% of the incoming ninth graders come from out of Northampton. But my question about the 90 um, initial evaluations is concerning if it is curriculum, but I'm wondering if you looked at the numbers and are many of those students coming from other schools where they perhaps weren't? I haven't had a chance to dig into that yet. Okay. It was just something that came up in conversation a couple okay. of days ago. All right. But it, it, is, it is worthy to look at. Okay. Um, so another question was, well, how can salaries go down if FTEs remain the same? There are two ways it can happen. Probably the, the easiest one to explain and the more typical one is if you have retirement of a higher paid person and they're replaced by someone who's lower on the salary scale, the position is the same, but the amount of money needed for the position is reduced. The second thing that happens in this particular budget is if you have shared staff, they may be, their funds may be apportioned differently. Um, like for example, I remember one staff I was looking at was 0.9 in one building and 0.1 in another building. And in the last budget, they just put all the salary in the 0.9 building because that was where the majority of the time was. We tried to do a little bit of a more fine tuning on that and adjusted the 0.1 to where the person is actually working. So that could cause some of the changes to happen as well. And what is longevity pay? So there are four groups that get this, or three groups for sure, and one that is kind of questionable. Um, ESPs, clerical, and custodians, and I'm gonna say teachers, all receive an additional stipend um, for an employee who's reached a contractually designated threshold. I gave you the example for ESPs. Um, after 15 years, they get an additional $250. Between 15 and 20, they get 450. 20 to 25 is 650. And 25 and up is 850. <coughs> um, I have teachers in uh, sort of, you know, this parentheses with question mark because there are two steps within our salary sch schedule that don't really function like steps do in the practice of the district. Um, 15 and 20. You know, it's like super steps because we have two through 10 and then, or 11, whatever that top step is. And then it jumps to 15. Um, those are paid for years of service to the district. So they don't count on after those other steps. So really, to me, those are also longevity pay. Um, I think probably awkwardly represented as steps, but I would say teachers have longevity pay, although there's an argument to be made that it's just a step. But that's what it is. And I would just add longevity is, is, a, is a standard practice in municipal contracts and yeah. other governmental contracts. So what's the, what's the purpose of it? Is, is it so that you're getting a bonus, but it's not getting worked into your salary, so it's a new base? Um, I think it's a recognition. I, I guess it's a recognition of employees who who typically have reached their top, who've long ago reached the top step, um, but have been long-standing employees and um, <coughs> you know, 15, 20, 25-year employees, and so it's sort of a incremental bonus and recognition of that. I suppose um, I think that's the that's the that's the basis for it. Um, And one was, is NESC a recurring cost? So our last accreditation was in 2012. Um, there's an amount in the budget, uh, a tiny amount, I think a couple thousand, four thousand dollars to cover um, annual dues to NESC, so that part is recurring. Um, when it's time for the next accreditation visit, I think it'll be 20, uh, 2022, I think it's every 10 years, then there'll be a substantial cost. Um, typically, that's an increment measured in tens of thousands of dollars rather than thousands of dollars because you have to pay for the site team, you have to pay for their hotels, you know, mm -hmm. you have to pay for all the overtime for people to get ready for the site visit. Well, this is where I had a definite question on. Um, is MEAS becoming obsolete? with the state mandates that we have stating uh, as far as even the current frameworks of the Common Core, if we, if we take on the Common Core, then what's the point of having NEAS coming in at that point? 
So let me take you back to the superintendent's executive conference 2013, where we had the president of NEASC there and said, you know, at one point, maybe we needed an impartial referee to tell the public whether we were actually doing what we, you know, claimed to be doing. But now, hardly a month goes by that we're not having some kind of audit, coordinated program review, accountability report, or high stakes test happening. So what do you really do for us? And what would you do if we all decided to quit at once? Uh, so on the basis of that, NEASC has been in negotiations to maybe loosen up some standards and maybe reduce some fees. Um, there is an argument to be made that maybe it doesn't serve the purpose that it originally did. Um, I think it's something that parents like to see. I think it gives them a feeling of security that you know their children are attending an accredited high school. Um, but one of the things that our group had done some research on before we sprung the question is asking college admissions officers whether it would make a difference. Um, and sort of the answer we got was, well, if the SAT scores are there and if the transcripts look good, we're probably not going to turn kids away because they're not in an accredited high school. Um, so um, my feeling, though, is we probably don't want to be the first one in this area to jump in on it. Well, Medicine has decided to do that, as has Ludlow. They both decided to opt out of NEAS, I believe. So I'm not. And others, I don't know. I, I'm, I will look into that. I haven't heard that. Ludlow wouldn't surprise me because of some other things that they they're just doing. They discussed it just the other day at um, the President's board meeting. But I think the thing that's good in our timing is we really don't have to cross that threshold for a number of years. So my recommendation as superintendent would be why don't we keep our powder dry for a while and see where the rest of the districts shake out on this, especially since we're in a community with a college. You know. It, it would be good to not sort of be leading the charge to get out of any ASC at but this time. If, but if, what is it that they do for us for the for the four thousand a dollar a year dues? I mean, well, do credit. I, I think it's I think it's not what they do for us so much as what we do for ourselves. Having been a part of the process, both as someone in uh, school being evaluated and as an evaluator. Taking time to reflect against a set of standards does give you a chance to look at your practices and see where you need to make improvements. And my, my thought is that most of the things schools get in their reports from NEASC aren't surprising. They're things they already found in their self-study. But if they hadn't done their self-study, then they might not have reflected on those problems or discovered those problems. So. And I can understand why that. that being this, uh, maybe a necessity when we had the framework um, as far as the curriculum. But now that we're going into the common core where everything is mandated all the way out, I don't, I, I'm just thinking that it's mm -hmm. becoming more sweet and waste of money. Okay. And I, so uh, why don't we have an ELL coordinator? Um, so we do have an ELL coordinator. Um, the, the function of that role is included within our director of student services. Um, she's the one who files all of our paperwork and, and maintains all of the standards that we need to meet for our ELLs. We currently have 103 ELLs in Northampton. I think if we get to 200, um, and if you continue any of the trajectories I've um, found in the entry findings, there will be a day when we get to 200. I, I really think we are ought to break that position out because at that point new licensure requirements kick in. If your district has more than 200 students, the ELL director needs to have licensure as um, English as a second language, transitional bilingual education, or an ELL license. And I think it's very unlikely that we would find someone who is licensed both as a special education teacher, a special education director, and one of those licenses. So I think it, you, we probably will have to look for a, a split in the position at that point. Yeah. Would, do you, would the in SEI endorsement count? Do you know? I don't think it counts because everyone needs to get the SEI endorsement. And so that's, that's where we are on that one. And will we ever get our elementary librarians back? So 
I take you back to first view budget. This is the list of the administrator's budget requests. You see nothing on there says elementary librarians. Um, when you look at what's on there, I think they represent what the administrators felt were their urgent needs. Um, but one of the things that I have to do in my role is try to get people to think beyond the things that are urgent and think about the things that are important but not urgent. Uh, and that's where strategy and strategic planning can help. Um, we're about to enter into a process of district improvement planning and that may come up as an issue then. Um, the time to talk about it is sort of when you're thinking about your long-term needs. It's hard for administrators, I think, to say that's what I want when they're facing all these other needs of kids who they feel they're not serving well and they want to have direct contact people with them. I think they, they when you're having kids who you feel like you're not reaching, having a teacher who you believe will help those kids feels like uh, a more important need to a principal than having a librarian who will help all kids but in a way that's harder to measure. Um, so I think, you know, I'd love to get elementary librarians back in our budget. I think they are important, um, but I think we have to go through the process of some long-term planning on what our key priorities as a district are to see whether we can get out of the urgent and important box a little bit and get into the not urgent but still important box. So um, it, it is, it is a, a definite need for the district. It is a deficit. Yes, please. I, I think direct care is urgent and incredibly imperative. I would say that this is urgent, though. So I'm just putting my opinion here that the, when I looked at the books and when this mm -hmm. lovely, incredible man, the, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Rich Winnick. The, the work that they're doing is amazing and saving us tens of thousands of dollars. Yes? Yes. Um, I think it's, it's a disservice that we don't have the resources here. Both, both in books, um, and I think that I uh, we need to take a long-term view on this because I think for literacy and working with high needs populations, I do think we could see some results. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned, and I actually think it's mm -hmm. just urgent. I guess I just sure. wanted to speak to that. Sure. I would like to second in. <laughs> I agree with you. And what's the status of the food services deficit? Last question that came in. Um, so as of March 23rd, the total uncollected debt was just over $3,000. My understanding is that this is a big improvement from numbers that the committee was looking at last year. Um, we've done a lot, both with um, direct certification, which helps because it, at le it doesn't address the uncollected past debt, but it, keeps families from accumulating new debt if we can get them on to free lunch or reduce lunch. Um, and now we're, we're, we're dealing, and we've done a lot with phone calls and working out plans with families. Now we're dealing with, I think, a group that's different than the group you looked at last year. Um, one of the things we found is that of that $3,000, 16% of them uh, account for 60% of the uncollected debt. Um, We've been able to get three of the 16 eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, but even if you say, okay, so the, there's real need there, if we forgive that debt, um, the other 13% probably still account for 55% of the uncollected debt. So um, we're really getting down to a tiny number of folks for whom this is a long-standing issue. And I'm not sure our current strategies are gonna be effective. Um, for the three of the 16 who've um, become eligible for your reduced lunch, I mean, and maybe the others, are, are you willing to go back and, you know, make a deal with them? I mean, because they, and if, they were, if they were eligible, then it just had to fill out the paperwork. And I'm not saying, like, wipe it off. I'm saying be able to get something of it so that they felt good about paying their, their debt and, you know, and it didn't break them. I think um, the answer is yes. I think, um, the experience, I hope parents would be able to report to you who've come to us and said, look, I want to try to work on clearing up my debt, but I, I can't do it 
you know, all in one chunk or all in monthly chunks? Can you, you know, work out some small payment plan to help us? Um, I think they'd tell you that our answer was yes. We're eager to work with families like that. And I think that was the main reason that we were able to get rid of most of the other debt. Um, and certainly we would offer that for the three or the 16 or any of them. Um, but I, I'm just feeling that, you know, s some of those folks in the 16, we're, we're not finding a way to be able to have that conversation. Can, if I can just can add on to, I think, to Blue's question too. Once somebody's approved as free or reduced lunch, we cannot go back and claim them as free or reduced, which is why the old debt stays on the books, because once you, there's an approval date, and if somebody was approved last week, for example, we can't go back and bill the federal government for the lunches up to that date. We can only go forward, because this is, whoever is free and reduced isn't really free. The federal government is paying for them. So you can't go back to the federal government and say, we just approved somebody, can you give us the money for the last four months? So the day somebody becomes eligible, we can go forward, but the old debt is still there for anything unpaid up until that day. So I think that brings us to the end of the questions. And again, I thank everyone for their questions on the proposed budget. Well, um, leave off. Save some money. Yeah, it's, it's calming. It's good. So, uh, should we blow that price? <laughs> hey, that's right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> could just take the middle one out of each of these. <laughs> save exactly. Save thirty percent. That's right. Okay. <coughs> Can do it. <laughs> so we are. Um, rearrange ourselves here uh, fill in um, discussion of the FY16 budget um, are there other questions for the superintendent um, in addition to the ones that he's just covered or any other discussion points on the um, on the budget as it's proposed yes Is that a yes yes okay um, I've already discussed it a little bit um, with the business director um, in the budget, there were two different things that I just needed to have clarified, and one was the over of the overage of the salary and how we came up with that much of an overage last year, and if the budget director if would like to address that, I would appreciate. You're it. referring to the seven hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that says in in our book somewhere it says teacher salary overpaid or something. Well, not teachers. It's not overpaid, so let's I know. be very careful I, I, with that word. That over budget is over very budget. different. There we go. I think you're referring to the second page under tab one. Okay, I'll look. Make sure we're on the same page, page so to speak. <laughs> are you referring to the 715000 in savings in FY15? I am. We've, we've touched on that before. The bulk of that was the way that the ESPs had been budgeted in the past, using the numbers that were in MUNIS rather than actually doing a calculation on a per diem basis. So approximately $400,000 of that was the over-budgeting for the ESPs this year. And it goes back a number of years as we traced it back. A lot of the rest of it is due to staff turnover that happened from 14 into 15. And I think there was one position budgeted in school choice that a decision was made not to fill. And then the other question I have is also, I guess, for you, is the um, amount of the 810000 in salary increases this year. Of that, that seems like a, such a high number that um, I was wondering, what's the percentage of that, or what's the number roughly, that are COLA and versus those are uh, representing steps? How much is representing the steps and how much is just cost of living? Because that sounds like a lot for cost of living, so I want to see where the yeah, steps It's not cost of living, but I didn't do a complete calculation. Mm -hmm. I actually, of COLA versus steps, I actually took next year's salary for each individual employee and plugged it in. But I did do a quick calculation earlier using the chart I had given the school committee maybe a month or two ago on just the teachers. So there were steps for almost every unit, but I only looked at the teachers. Um, and the estimated cost of the steps just for the teachers going into next year was about three hundred seventy thousand dollars. Do you know how many teachers that represents? Of, no, of, not of our remember. staff. I'd have to go back to that chart. Okay. I, I believe in terms of percentage, it was about eighty-one percent. It was pretty high, yeah. And so that's eighty-one percent of our teaching staff then um, 
has less than 11 years experience as a teacher or is that what it is or no, in our district? No, it means they're, they're placed on less than step 11. As you know, in our district, there's kind of this salary cap, sort of a soft salary cap at step five. So many teachers are getting paid at a step that is much lower than their actual years of teaching experience. So then the actual um, COLA is a lot less than the 810. I mean, it, it could be around the 300. I think it's less than that. Even less than that? OK. Any questions? So, um, so the plan going forward then is we have our um, our first meeting in April is essentially the meeting at which we will need to take a vote on the budget in order to meet the April 15th deadline chart. Um, we're gonna, we're obviously gonna try to um, try to look for any new information that's coming out of Beacon Hill about any of these aid programs, but unfortunately, we're probably not gonna know. Uh, as the superintendent said, until mid, mid, um, well, mid to late April, the House will release its budget, um, and then the Senate will release their budget into May, um, and then you know the two bodies will will duke it out in the month of June, and we'll probably you know have a budget by an actual budget by the end of June. So um, we're most likely going to have to build. We're most likely going to have to approve a budget based on what we know right now. Um, and the chapter 70 numbers, I mean, there's lobbying going on. I know the superintendent has, has a letter that he's um, shared with you. The superintendents are lobbying for $50, you know, for an increase to $50 per child, chapter 70 versus the governor's 20. Um, and I haven't been able to get much indication about how much support there is for that. Um, and then there's all the other cuts, like the kindergarten cuts. Um, and so all of these all of these, I don't even know what the total kindergarten program cost is for the state, but I assume it would quickly zero, cancel out any increase. You know, what we're losing in that mm -hmm. would probably be canceled out by a Chapter 70 increase, even the extra $5. Mm -hmm. So so that's sort of where we are on that side of things. Um, so if you have other questions, other um, concerns, that come up, <laughs> constituent questions between now and the next meeting, um, be the time to get them to the business administrator or the superintendent. I don't know if you could answer or say this. For the public, I'm sure those people who are watching this, but also for us, I, I think I am at least sobered by the funding for education in our state. And what could people do? Call Peter Cocut? Like what recourse do you recommend, if you can recommend, for those citizens out there who are concerned, or us? I think, I mean, I think well, calling your own representative, calling, um, you know, calling the speaker, calling, well, the Senate president, who is our representative. Um, uh, I think, you know, letting that be known. I know that, um, I know the superintendent um, and the superintendent's association has been urging their membership to write letters to, um, to legislative leaders, particularly about Chapter 70 spending. Um, and I think the same could be true for, you know, individual school committees could do that as well. Um, I'm assuming the Mass Association of School Committees is probably going to have a similar mm -hmm. lobbying effort. The Mass Municipal Association has been lobbying on this issue as well. And there was a hearing, there, were, there was some hearing, there was a hearing last week, I think at UMass, um, the Ways, Joint Ways and Means Committee held a hearing. Um, and I know that MMA and, and also school leadership were there testifying, and a lot of time was spent not only on Chapter 70, but on charter school reimbursement. And um, there's just so many issues that need to be addressed. Um, so, of course, it's against the backdrop of this structural deficit that they're talking about um, that has to be closed. So, uh, so that's going to be the challenge. Yeah. The people could contact. All these people, though, the representatives. No, no, no doubt about it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. let them know because now is going to be the time. I mean, the the House is formulating their version of the budget, mm -hmm. and so they're going to. But again, 
if they put stuff back in, they have to figure out where they're going to cut, um, what other things they're going to cut. Um, and, you know, the governor's been, uh, you know, has staked out some, some positions on some issues that will be hard for them to probably, well, increasing lo unrestricted local government aid, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's helpful to us. But when then when you lower Chapter 70, you're basically yeah. taking it away right. on the other side. Right. Or when you're not fully funding charter school reimbursement, oh. you're taking it away. Or when charter school's going up, you're taking so. So that's the challenge, but um, but I'm not sure what options they're going to have. And obviously, he's kind of set the table by saying we have a spending problem, not a revenue problem, which I don't think um, there's there's unanimity on that issue on Beacon Hill. But that's how he's framed the issue. So um, so new revenues are sort of off the table. Is so that becomes the challenge. So it's all about cutting spending. Um, so. You didn't make me feel better. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish I could. I well, wish. I thank you. I wish I could. Um, but so anyway, we'll see. I have something to say, uh, say on that. As a school committee member, on April 29th, they have Day on the Hill, and I just didn't announce it to anybody. I've been in the past, and it's a wonderful time to get to talk to not only your legislators, but other people's too. You know, they come, and, and it's it's very informative, and it's actually very empowering. And you also can get good ideas from other districts, such as like the Wilbraham. They they've had a wonderful. Um, they've actually led things and, and started things, and now they're leading the NASC. But anyway, so I'd like to go today on the Hill on April 29th. It would be great if anybody else would like to go. Um, and awesome. Other questions or are there uh, discussion or questions for the superintendent? I have a, a, a comment. I just want to say thank you very, very much. This is what, my third or fourth year, fourth year looking at the budget, I think. And this is the first year that it was um, very comprehensible and it made sense and I could understand as opposed to just looking at figures and trying to figure things out. It was, it's very readable. And um, I want to thank you for spending the time to do that. And I want to thank you, um, Dr. Provost, also for taking the time to be so thorough with answering the questions and setting everything up so that um, it just feels empowering that way, too. So thank you very much for making it so clear this year. That's all I got to say. OK. Um, so we do not have any new business items that I'm aware of this evening. I would just remind uh, members and the public that the budget and property subcommittee will meet once again on April 2nd 2015 at 3 30 in the superintendent's office and then our next regularly scheduled school committee meeting is April 9th 2015 here in the JFK community room at 7 15 p.m. and of course that will be the night that we vote on the um, on the school final school budget I will now entertain a motion to adjourn move to adjourn Second. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned.